So good evening to us all, and we are grateful for your time and interest to today's program. Today promises to be a very interesting discussion. We have in our midst a very renowned lawyer who we've been observing from afar. And to us, she was the best person for this job. Her name is Gertrude Amoko Ama. Ms. Gertrude is a lecturer at the UPSA Law School and the Programs Coordinator for the Center for Practical and Multidisciplinary Legal Education and Training for UPSA. She obtained her first degree from the University of Ghana, Theater Act. I'm sure she's very good in acting. And then proceeded to do law. Then she went to the law school. And then had her master's in corporate and commercial finance from London School of Economics and Political Science. She has taught company law, international trade and investment, Ghana legal system, legal methods, among others as UPSA. So today, um, our topic, as we've already indicated, will look through started businesses in Ghana should help us understand that if I'm a Ghanaian entrepreneur, if I'm a foreign investor and I want to invest in Ghana, first of all, what are some of the various companies that I need to know? What are the differences between those companies? Why would I recommend or delve into one and not the other? Look at the differences between the forms of companies and then we come into the legalities as to the registration, among other things, on company registration, doing business in Ghana, as well as what are some of the legal pitfalls that we are likely to encounter as investors, foreign investors, local investors. And if we do go contrary to the law, what is the compliance regime in terms of companies in Ghana? So Gertrude, welcome to today's episode of The Lawyer's Diary. Yes, thank you so much for having me and um, good evening to your wonderful audience. Very well. So it's now 6 5. I think we can start. So, get you. Um, I'm a foreign investor. Okay. I want to invest in Ghana. And I come to you as a lawyer. Um, what, what, what are some of the companies that is readily available in Ghana? Are there differences in them? And then, which one would you recommend for me? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, once again, I bring you greetings from the UPSA Law School, and um, I must commend you and the team for such an initiative, the Lawyer's Diary, which seeks to explain certain um, legal issues to the entire country, as well as our audience from outside of Ghana. Um, to answer your question, I think for the benefit of our audience, we must first of all understand that we do not only conduct business through companies. There are many other forms of what we call business organizations that can be used for the conduct of, for the conduct of business. What I'm essentially saying is that as a businessman, as a businesswoman, you intend to carry on some form of business. There are quite a number of options that are open to you by way of the type of vehicle, the type of organizational form that you would you'd want to use to conduct your business. Many a times the company or the incorporated company is the most popular form which comes to us readily but we must understand that there are so many other forms of business organizations. For example, the sole proprietorship. 
We can even talk of partnerships. We can also talk of the incorporated company, which is, I would want to believe, the focus of our discussion this evening. But before I move on to the incorporated company, I just want to throw a little light on these other forms of business organizations that I have mentioned. So that at the end of the day, our audience would understand that I can do business through the use of, for example, a sole proprietorship. I can do business through the use of a partnership or even through the use of an incorporated company. But then the question that readily comes to mind is that, what, what will determine which form of business organization I should utilize to conduct my business? And number of factors, it could depend on the size of the business that you intend doing. It could even depend on the nature of the business. And one very important thing is what we refer to as the nature of the liability that you need to assume. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was muted at a point. And it could also depend on the nature of the liability that we want to assume while carrying out that business. So we can briefly when look you at- say, When you say nature of business, do you mean the purpose for which the company, or what, what do I want to do with the Definitely. company? Definitely. What you want to do, what is the type, what is the kind of business that you want to do? If, for example, you want to sell sachet water, do I necessarily need an incorporated company to sell sachet water? If I want to sell pens or but pencils or stationery, <laughs> do I need to form an incorporated <laughs> company to be able to do so? Or can I, for example, use a sole proprietorship, which is the easiest form of business organization that can be used to conduct business? So that's exactly what I mean by the nature of the business that you'd want to you'd want to utilize. So just in the next few minutes, you mentioned something about liability. When you say liability for the general populace, what is liability? Okay. Now every business comes with or is likely to come with certain financial obligations. Please unmute yourself. Yes, I have just um, done so. Every business is likely to come with certain financial obligations, what we'll technically want to refer to as liability. So, for example, in the conduct of your business, your business incurs a debt of, let's say, 1,000 Ghana cities or 2,000 Ghana cities. The question that you'd be interested in asking yourself as a business owner is that, is that debt my personal debt? Is that a debt that I'm supposed to get into my personal bank account and pay for? Or is that debt a debt of the, the form of business organization that I'm using? So for example, if I'm using a limited liability company to carry out my business, is the debt, is the financial obligation a debt of the company as an entity? Or is it the debt of me as a person? So that essentially is what we mean by liability. And as we go ahead in the discussion, we come to the realization that it is a very essential factor to be considered in selecting the type of business organization that you want to do. So for example, if you don't mind bearing all the liabilities of your business, if you don't mind bearing all the financial obligations and debts of your business, then you could, for example, just use a a sole proprietorship where there's no difference between the debts of the business you are doing and your own personal debts. So if you are doing the sole so let, proprietorship- let's, let's, kind of understand, business, let's understand it all. Is it your case or your point that it depends on the individual? If at the end of the day, there is a cost, there is a debt on the company, if I can bear it personally, then I don't need to expand it into a big company. I can just make it a small enterprise by tagging it as a sole proprietorship company? To a large extent, yes, that is so. So if you want the type of business organization that you could, you are merged, you as an individual, you are the same as your business. And we'll come to explain these in the coming minutes. It might seem a bit uh, technical at this point, but what we are essentially saying is that there are some types of business organizations where there's no difference between the business owner 
and the business. And there are other types of business organizations where there's a difference between me as a business owner and the business that I'm doing. So it is up to you as a business owner to choose the type of business organization that you think you are comfortable with in order for you to conduct your business through. But of course, you would also come to the realization that one of the things we mentioned was the nature of the business. So if you want to carry out banking business, for example, you cannot say that uh, I want to do banking, but uh, in order to open a bank, I think I'll just want to be a sole proprietor. No, that is contrary to law. So aside the fact that you as an individual, as a business owner or as a potential business owner, you have the choice to decide the type of business organization that you want to use. We must also realize that by law, there are certain businesses that can only be carried out through a particular form of business organization. So for example, you can't say that you want to operate a bank, but you're going to operate the bank as a sole proprietor. Definitely not. Yes, so I was just making the preliminary observation that the operation of a business can be done through several mediums or can be done through quite a number of mediums. You can either have the usual one business, one man or one woman type of business, what we refer to as a sole proprietorship. So a uh, Kofi Menu Enterprises uh, or uh, Adua Mansa Ventures where you have some stationery in your container or in your kiosk that you are operating. For such that type of business, you have the option of registering the business name that you are using. So for example, if you decide to open a small container somewhere and call it Amazing Grace or God is Good Enterprise or God is Good Ventures, by law, it is possible for you to register that name the Amazing Grace Limited or the God is Good Ventures. You can register it by law at the Office of the Registrar of Companies. Once you register that name, mind you, it is the name of the business that you are registering. So the benefit that comes with that is that that name becomes exclusively for your use. So once you register the name Amazing Grace Enterprise or Amazing Grace Ventures or Amazing Grace uh, uh, victuals or what have you that name becomes exclusively for your use many a times this form of business organization the sole proprietorship is very easy to begin uh, and it's also quite easy and convenient to run but of course the the difficulty like i mentioned earlier is the fact that you cannot use that to carry out every type of business especially more complex or more highly regulated businesses cannot be carried out through that medium now we also have what we call a partnership. Many a times you look at um, professional persons who are professionals, for example, accountants. So, before we go to the partnership, you right. mentioned something about the name of a company, the exclusivity, where if I choose Oseberma Enterprise, nobody can use Oseberma Enterprise. Um, is that not quite unfair? Because if um, I, I bear the same name, the fact that you were there earlier, why should I be restricted from not being allowed to use the same name? Okay. Now, when you look at the, the law under which you can do the registration of your business name, which is what we call the Registration of Business Names Act, 1962, the Act 151, the aim of the law is to allow for persons who carry out business through the use of sole proprietorships to be able to, for such people to get the exclusive use of the names of the business. But one thing you even need to note is that if you are carrying out the business, the sole proprietorship with your own name, for example, or say Berima, then you need not register that name for obvious reasons. But if you are carrying out the sole proprietor business with a name which is other than your own name. So for example, like I cited Amazing Grace Enterprise, uh, uh, Legally Nice Enterprise, and so on and so forth. That is in that case, then you can register that name. Now, as to whether it is unfair or not, in my opinion, I wouldn't necessarily say that it is unfair. 
because as a business owner, the, the law wants to give you the opportunity to enjoy some exclusivity with respect to the business name that we are using as a sole proprietor. And I think it's fair enough because we don't want the situation where the same sole proprietorship uh, name is being used by so many others because that can potentially cause confusion in the system. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it is unfair to, to provide for such a regime and that- the well, can, I, can I then add some abbreviations, say, or say bear in mind to bracket OB Enterprise, or the fact that that name have been used kind of sets a bar from any person bringing a similar name. You see, once that name has been registered under the law I am referring to, then no other person can register her sole proprietorship using that same name. Now, let us be mindful of the fact that, for example, if you decide to use OB Enterprise, if that is satisfactory to the registrar, that name could be registered and no other person will be allowed to register under Act 151 with that same name, OB Enterprises. Maybe if that person can add OBE or OBWH or what have you to bring some difference between his and yours, then that would be acceptable. But under no circumstances can two of two, two names, two of the same names be registered under this regime that I'm referring to. Yes. I get it. Then we, we can move into the partnership. Then. Right. So very briefly, so that we don't spend too much time. But on before, the before, before that, uh, right. on the on the sole proprietorship, is there a financial cap on how much I should get before I start a sole proprietorship, or for that it doesn't really matter? Not at all. It doesn't matter. That is entirely up to you. Looking at your strength and looking at the nature of your business, and that is essentially one of the advantages of such a business. There's no uh, limit or there's no requirement for you to have a particular amount of money before you can start that business. So with five CDs, with 10 CDs, with 20 CDs, 100 CDs, 1,000 CDs, you can begin your sole proprietorship business. Yes, may, may I proceed? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Great, so um, very briefly, I also mentioned a partnership. Now, when we talk of a partnership, it is it's merely an, an association of um, two or more individuals who come together to carry on business jointly so that they can make some profit out of the business they are carrying out. Now, by law, the maximum number of persons that can form a partnership is 20. So we are looking at between two and 20 individuals coming together so that they can carry on business jointly so that they can also make profit out of that business. Once again, there's a, a legal regime for the registration or the Yes, so I was just making the point that, can you hear me please? Yes, I can hear you. I'll okay. please that if you join in, kindly mute yourself. Right. Yes, go ahead. So go ahead. once again, if you decide to conduct business through a partnership, there's a legal regime that you have to abide by. And that legal regime or the name, the, the statute, the law that provides for all matters relating to partnerships is what we call the Incorporated Private Partnership Act. 1962, the Act 152. So in my earlier comments, I was saying that when you look at many professional uh, professionals, architects, accountants, uh, lawyers, it is very common to find them carrying out their business through the use of what we call a partnership. Now, there's a document that is very important or that is very key to the formation of a partnership and that is what we call a partnership agreement so essentially before you can form a partnership by law you need to register what we call the partnership agreement like the name suggests it is this document that will tell us all the things that relate to the business you are about to conduct the partnership so in that partnership agreement which is a legally binding document you need to be able to tell us the name of the partnership 
uh, the type of business that the partnership wants to carry out, what the, the rights and duties of the various partners are, and so on and so forth. So for example, if myself, uh, Mr. Eubank, and then uh, Madam Adua decide to come together to form a partnership so that we can provide accounting services, maybe we are chartered accountants and we decide that the best business um, vehicle or the best vehicle we can use to conduct our business is a partnership, then there'll be the need for us to have a partnership agreement, which would tell us all the rules that should regulate the, the business that we are, we are going into. Now, there are certain consequences or there are certain things that happen once you register a partnership. But uh, because these are merely introductory matters, I would not want to go too much into that, but rather to focus on the question that I was initially asked and which has led me on this long uh, journey and rather move on. Oh, it's to it's, what it's been very informative. It's been very, very informative. Yes, um, and then move on to the right. What, what we call the, the company or the incorporated company, the incorporated company. Now, when we talk of an incorporated company, which I get a sense will be the, the focus, the actual focus of today's discussion, we are simply referring to a, a body which is formed and registered under in Ghana, what we call the, the Companies Act. So when you form a body or you register a body under the oh, Companies okay. Act 2019, Act 919, what you have just formed will be referred to as a company. So uh, this is my copy of the Companies Act 2019, Act 990, which I'm just showing to you. So by now, my good friends, you would have noticed that depending on the type of business organization that you want to use for your business, or to run your business. There's a different law that governs it. Remember we said that if you want to register a partnership, that will be governed by the Incorporated Private Partnership Act at 152. If you want to have a sole proprietorship and register the name, just the name of your business, you can do that registration under Act 152. But if you want to use a company for your business, then you must be able to do that registration and follow the requirements of the Companies Act 2019, Act 992. Now, um, I remember, if I remember correctly, the question that was initially posed to me was what are the types of companies that one can register in Ghana? Yes, there are a number of types of companies, but before I, I go ahead to make that point, let me just give out this information. And it's very important for our audience who may be joining us from outside Ghana. We need to understand that when it comes to the formation and administration of a company, it is the law of a particular country that determines how it should be done. So if you come to Ghana and you want to form a company in Ghana, you have to abide and follow the law in Ghana that provides for those things. So the point I'm essentially making is that the formation and administration of a company depends on the law of the particular country in which you are in. So if you're coming from the UK, you cannot come into Ghana with the view that, oh, in the UK, these are the types of companies you can register in the UK. So in Ghana too, it is the same thing. No, it may not be the case. Or if you're coming from the Netherlands or from Togo or wherever you may be coming from, know that you have to follow the law in Ghana that provides for how companies should be formed and how companies should be registered. So in Ghana, you want to ask yourself, what are the types of companies that our law, which is the Companies Act, allows us to register or to I form? Like you to I give us a I, can... I hope I'm not muted. OK, so in Ghana, we can refer to what we refer what we what is known as a company limited by shares that's one of the one of the companies uh, the types of companies that can be formed here in ghana a company limited by shares we can also look at what we call a company limited by guarantee we can also look at what we call an unlimited company and then we can also look at an external company 
And all of these different types of companies can either fall under or can either be private companies or public companies. So if you want to register a company in Ghana, you are either registering a company limited by shares, a company limited by guarantee, an unlimited company or an external company. And all these four you know, different types of companies can either be what we call a private company or a public company. So with that background, maybe we can then move in or move on to look at these various types of companies that I've mentioned with the permission of our, our moderator, of course. Okay, so when we, when, when we say a company limited by guarantee, yes. what, what is a guarantee company? What goes into it? And why would someone want to do a guarantee company? Okay, very well. Now, when we talk of companies limited by guarantee, which is essentially one of the types of companies that can be registered in Ghana, we are looking at the type of companies that are usually formed to pursue charitable activities or non-profit activities. So you realize that with these types of companies, the, the purpose of forming them is not to make money. Hmm. It is actually an offense for a company limited by guarantee to carry on business for the purpose of making profit. So because companies limited by guarantee are formed so that they can pursue charitable uh, purposes or non-profit activities, they are not allowed to what? pursue business for the purpose of making profit. But in spite of this, it's interesting to note that this does not mean, you know, this, this uh, restriction, it does not mean that they are actually prohibited from making profit from their activities. It is possible that in the course of the activities of a company limited by guarantee, they would make some profit. But we must note that that profit that they make, it must not be distributed amongst those that came together to form that company. But that profit must normally be invested in the activities of the company. So let, uh, let me give so it. It's more, more, it's more or less like if you make any money from a guarantee company, yes, you have to plow back the profit into the activities of the company. Absolutely. The, the reason I'm asking is that you know that we, 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 we have a lot of NGOs around mm. that uses the name for foreign in foreign don donors. Right. Some donors make um, investments into them, and sometimes reports are that some of the monies are siphoned into mm. various activities. Mm. Are we now saying that one they are going contrary to the purpose for which they were formed? And if that is so, what 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 has the law done? to ensure that this thing doesn't happen. Yes, thank you. I mean, what you have said is exactly what the case is. That for companies limited by guarantees, if, although they are not formed to make profit, if in the course of the activities, they make some profit, that profit must be plowed back into the business. So with the kind of scenario that you have just described, it is actually contrary to law to form a company limited by guarantee and siphon or use any profits that are made in the course of its activities for the personal gain of the members of that company. Now, when you look at the law, you realize that any time that the, a company limited by guarantees goes contrary to uh, this purpose, which they have, the law prescribes that there's a punishment that must be given to those who came together to form that company or the members of that company. So you realize that the officers and members of that company will be liable to pay to the Registry of Companies an administrative penalty of 25 penalty units for every day that the company carries on business. Typical example, many of our old school um, associations, so uh, uh, Ghana Senior High School Old Students Association, um, Saint, Saint, whatever, Old Girls Association, and so on and so forth. 
or even some churches are registered as what companies limited by guarantee. Limited by guarantee. And the reason is that they are formed not so that they can go ahead and pursue any business, but rather so that they can pursue charitable activities. So for example, if your old boys association or your old girls association, they decide to produce some watches or some uh, books or some jewelry or what have you for purposes of selling it to the members. Whatever profits may be made out of that, that activity is not supposed to be distributed amongst those who came together to form that association, but rather it's supposed to be plowed back into the, okay. the business. Very well. Yes. So we yes. can continue. Okay, good. So um, that, that is a portion for those of us who have registered businesses as, as companies limited by guarantee. But um, I think we can also look at companies limited by shares, which is also another type of company that you can register or form under the Companies Act of Ghana. Now, when we talk of a company limited by shares, it's, it's that type of company which is formed for purposes of carrying on business so that the members or the shareholders of the company can make what? Profit. So unlike the company limited by guarantee, which is not formed to carry on business for purposes of profit making, the company limited by shares is formed just for that purpose, so that business can be carried on and so that profit will be made for the members or the shareholders of that company. Now, the, the, if at the end of the financial year or the activities of a company limited by shares in a particular year, the company realizes that it has made some profit from its operations. So maybe you have, uh, you have registered a company limited by shares, which is into the production of mobile phones, or which is the, in the pro production of um, air conditioners and so on and so forth. And at the end of the year, you realize that you have made some profit. It is possible you might want to plow back a portion of that profit into the business. But it would also be the case that once profit has been made, you would want to distribute a portion of that profit to those who contributed capital for the administration of the business of that company. So as a shareholder of a company limited by shares, you notice that at the end of the financial year of the company, when profits are made, and um, the profits are to be distributed, what we call dividends. When we talk of dividends, we are simply looking at the, the portion of the company's profit that can legally be distributed amongst the shareholders. You realize that at the end of the financial year, dividends will be declared and you'll be paid some dividends. So for example, our good friends who hold or who purchased sh some shares in a company like MTN, you realize that once in a while you'll be there and then you'll be sent a notice or what have you showing that a dividend of this amount has been paid into your account. And those are some of the benefits that you get by being a shareholder in a company limited by shares. Now, if you recall, when we started our discussion, one of the things that I mentioned should help you in deciding the type of company that you want to form is liability. And our moderator even went on to ask, what do we mean by liability? This is where the discussion on liability becomes very, very important. If you are a member of a company limited by shares, the, the position of the law is that your liability in terms of your financial obligation to the company, once there's, for example, a debt, your liability is, is restricted or is, is limited to an amount of money that you have not paid on the shares that you hold. I would explain um, that. I would explain yes. that in very, very simple language. First of all, when we talk of a limited liability company, when we say a company is a limited liability company, what we are essentially saying is that the liabilities of the company does not extend to the shareholders of the company or even to the officers of the company, those who work in that company. So if you belong okay. to a company limited 
by, by, by shares, or if you belong to generally a limited liability company, if there's a liability, that liability is the liability of the company as an entity and not your personal liability. Maybe okay. even before I explain that, let us look at this. And maybe I can do this with the, with the aid of uh, a topical issue which is happening or which has been happening around us in the last few years. So I wouldn't mention the specific company, but a few months ago, there was a statement by one business owner who had formed a company and that company had run into certain difficulties, um, which led to many people who had invested in that company having their investments locked into the company. Then we hear that the person who formed that company says that, look, if your money is locked up in that business, you are not to come to me as a person for that money. You are supposed to go to the company to take that money from the company. And then one may want to ask, what, what does that mean? So Yes, go ahead, please. Do you have a question, please? He Hello. Hello, madam. Yes. OK, uh, so in conclusion, meaning that as for the company limited by. Uh, please, is that a moderator? I, I can hardly hear you. Hello. Yes. Please, can you hear me now? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I want to, I want to, uh, I want you to clear this misconception concerning the company limited by liability. Uh, so meaning that company limited by uh, liability, the members of the company are not liable, uh, are not liable for in case the company run into loss or run into bankruptcy. Yes, please go on. Yeah, so I, I, I want to know, I want to know, is that a case or? Yes, so we are saying that generally, the members of a company limited by shares or the members of a limited liability company, whenever there's some liability, that liability is the liability of the company and not the liability of the individual shareholder. Okay. But in the case of a company limited by shares, your liability as a shareholder is limited to any amount that you have not paid on the shares that you hold. Let me explain that with the aid of an illustration. For example, Mr. Bedu, you purchased shares from MTN somewhere last year, and the total cost of your shares was 1,000 Ghana cities. However, at the time that you bought the shares, you did not have all the 1,000 Ghana cities, so you paid 500 cities, half of it. Uh, that means that you are indebted to the company to the tune of how much? 500 Ghana cities. Because this company is a company limited by shares, the, your, your obligation or your liability to that company is only with the amount that you have not paid on the shares that you hold. So Mr. Bedu, in your case, for example, remember you still owe 500 Ghana cities from the shares that you, 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 you purchased from that company. If the company makes a call on you, or if the company requests that, look, come and make good your liability, your liability is only limited to that 500 Ghana cities that you owe, nothing more, nothing less. That means that if at the time that you purchased your shares, you paid all your 1,000 Ghana cities, that would mean that you do not have any obligation to the company. You don't have any financial obligation to the company. And that is why I was saying that in this um, scenario or in this case, which happened in this country, the business owner can say that, look, the company that I formed was a limited liability company. As a matter of fact, it's a company limited by shares. So me as the business owner, I am different from the business or I'm different from the company that I formed. And that is one of the defining things about an incorporated company. When we say that a company is incorporated or a company is registered, in the eyes of the law, 
that thing that has been formed, that, that company, it becomes an entity in law. It becomes a person in law. And that entity or that person that has been formed in the form of a company, it is different. It is separate. It is not the same as me, the person who formed the company. So it doesn't matter whether I'm the managing director, I'm the chief executive officer, I'm the majority shareholder of that company. Insofar as it is an incorporated company, the business has a personality of its own. The business is different. It is separate. It is distinct from those who formed it or even from those who administer it. What, so what, is, what if, what if um, we all see that even though the company is separated from the people who formed it, but they were using the money for their personal gains. Yes. They were buying big cars, buying big houses without investments. Okay. In that case, why should I chase the company and not the person I saw using my money? Absolutely. So what you need to note is that the description or the illustration or the position I have just stated is the general position of the law that once you form a, a company, an incorporated company, that company becomes an entity on its own, a personality on its own, a person on its own, which is different from those who formed it or even those who manage and administer, administer it. But there's an exception. So there are limited cases or there are limited grounds on which the law would come in and say that, look, although the company is different from those who formed it, because these defined clearly limited exceptions are present, the law is going to throw away, is going to disregard the principle I have just described to you. What the lawyers will tell you is called uh, the principle of separate legal personality. There are cases in which the law would disregard that and say that, look, in this particular case, because, for example, the, 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 the operations of the company were being done to perpetrate some fraudulent activities, the law is going to disregard this principle of a separate legal personality and say that we are going to treat you, you, the, the business owner, and the company as one and the same so that the liabilities of the business owner will become, sorry, the liabilities of the company will become the liabilities of the business owner. But that is usually a tall order. What the lawyers would once again tell you is called piercing the corporate veil. Piercing the corporate veil simply means that the law is going to disregard the fact that generally the business and the owners are separate and the law is going to treat the business and the owners as one and the same. There are defined circumstances in which that can happen. So it might not be enough to say that, oh, uh, the business owner was riding in a Rolls Royce or I saw him riding in a, a, a Phantom, whatever, or I saw him buy a three bedroom house at East Livon. That alone may not mean that uh, the, the, the law will be ready to combine the company's liability with his personal um, liability. Mr. Moderator, can you hear me please? Yes, yes, I can hear you. So in that case, how do um, the investors know that the person was taking such monies and not using it for the purpose for which it was established? You mentioned something about fraud and you said lifting the veil. If my money is locked, how do I get my money back? Well, uh, that, that, that is a very reason why uh, when things like this happen, you may want to seek legal advice. That is the very reason why the lawyers are there. So that uh, you want to find out from your lawyers that this is what I have noticed. I have this amount of money locked up in this particular company. However, the company is telling me that it's a limited liability company. So it's not as if the money uh, is with they, the owners of the company, loosely speaking, the, the shareholders of the company, or even those who administer the company. And that I should go after the company as an entity for the for the money that is locked up in there. However, uh, I've also heard there's something called lifting the corporate veil. But how would I be able to determine that uh, my particular situation is a situation in which the court would lift the veil and disregard 
uh, the, the supposed veil that exists between the company and those who own it or those who even administer it. So my question is that these are things that when they come up, it, it, it requires rigorous um, investigation and studying by those who have the capacity to be able to determine whether a case has been made for the lifting of the corporate bill. And even that, it would have to be subjected to the courts who would ultimately have to decide whether uh, you have made a case for that or, or otherwise. Um, very well. Thank you very much. We'll go to the liability regime that if I am a limited liability company and then I fail to go in accordance with what the law says, is there some kind of liability that will be associated with it? But before then, our, this program is sponsored by Enos Travel and Tour. We have the CEO of Enos Travel and Tour. Dennis Amartin, please, you have about five minutes to tell us about what Enos does before we go to our next segment. Thank you, Enos Travel. You can take over. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Martin. I think this conversation has been very enlightening. I've, I've learned a lot, and I know a lot of the participants have also learned a lot. Thank you very much, Namo Koama. I think I know how to probably deal with Enos Travel company shares at the moment. Anyway, Enos Travels basically deals with anything that comes with travels. If you want to travel outside the country, do everything with regard to helping you apply for your visa. Um, if you get into your destination, we book the flight for you, we book um, your car reservations and everything. What we do now currently is we organize tours in Dubai. We have and Misty, and it was a, a successful one. We have another tour coming up in November, which is also from Ghana to Kenya through to Dubai, and it's going to be a week. It's going to be a week event. Now, this tour actually includes your flight, your hotel, all the tour. <laughs> that you are going to do in Kenya and in Dubai, and it's only cost nine, nine, six thousand Ghana, so it's not seven thousand. Everything is included. Now, if you want to join this trip, all you need to do is go to Instagram and search for Eno's Travels. The idea is Eno.travels on on Facebook is Enos Travel, and then on Twitter is Travels. Enos Travels, our motto is taking you to the world and beyond. So basically, as I said, if you have any question or if you want any information about any other country abroad, if you have interest in studying, uh, studying abroad, if you have interest in traveling for fun or for leisure to any of the other countries, or even if you're interested in having a local tour, Enos Travels is there to help you out. So as I said, you can find us on Instagram, Enos Travels, and I will actually put uh, contact information in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to us, you can actually do. Thank you very much, uh, Loyal Severi Morning Sports. And uh, we are happy to sponsor this program. And I know as we go on, we would have a lot of uh, other professionals to share other information with us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. And um, thank you for also being our main sponsor since the time we started. So now let's go on on our discussion. The next phase was on the liability regime. Are there any liabilities when you are into limited liability companies? And what is the position of the law on these matters? Okay. Well, um, first of all, let me say that on a much lighter note, clearly all roads uh, are leading to Enos travel and tours for those of us who want to visit Kenya and Dubai in the coming months. So um, they can expect a, a call from me on making me making arrangements to visit um, Kenya. 
particularly. Or and the, the, the truth of the matter is that any lawyer that comes on this show also has a discount within Australia. So you are sorted on that. Oh, even better. Even better. Yes. Even better. All right. So all thanks to Enos Travel and Tours. Anyway, so with respect to um, liabilities, the, 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 this is quite a, a broad question that you have asked because liability can arise from quite a number of areas. So we haven't had a chance to go through the formation process or the registration process of companies limited by shares yet. But there are some liabilities that arise in there by virtue of you not complying with the regime that is provided for the registration of a, a company limited by shares or in fact for any other company. Now, you'd also realize that in the course of the administration of a company, there are certain things that a company is required to do. So if a company fails to do any of these things, there are a number of liabilities that can arise. So for example, if you look at the law in Ghana, the, the position of the law is that when it comes to the directors of a company, every company that is incorporated in this country must have at least um, two directors. And out of that two, at least one of them must be ordinarily resident in Ghana. That is the position of the law. So if at any point in time, it turns out that a company is being administered or is being run um, without the use of without having at least two directors, one of whom is ordinarily resident in Ghana, there are some liabilities that arise yeah. with respect to the, the payment of penalties by the company itself and whichever director is cognizant of the fact that this is being done uh, without following due process. Now, even still on the, on the issue of those who administer and control a company, those who we call the directors of a company, you realize that there are certain duties that the law imposes on you if you're a director of a company. So for example, you are expected to act in utmost good faith towards the company. You are not supposed to um, use the, 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 you know, the profits or the capital of the company for your own personal gain. You are not supposed to use the information you get from the company for your own personal gain. If you breach any of these um, duties that are imposed on you by law. There are liabilities that also arise mainly by way of the payment of fines. And these are liabilities that can be enforced by particular people who work within the company. So yes, on the issue of liabilities, liabilities can arise even at the point of the formation of a company and also in the course of the administration of a company on so many issues, a, a, a thousand and one issues, some of which I have just uh, mentioned. So um, drawing down the curtain, you talked about sole proprietorship, you talked about partnership, you talked about the limited liability company by shares, by guarantee, and then the unlimited. And then um, we also talked about one other thing, which I forgot. External companies, we mentioned external, yeah, external companies. companies. We are, well, maybe we are here to talk about the external company, yes. but in terms of corporate finance, which of these companies is best suited for investors and why? Well, one, once again, my preliminary comments on the purpose or the reason why you are forming the company reigns. As an investor, depending on the type of business that you want to do, Depend, de depending on the nature of liability that you want to incur, you'd want to choose one of these companies. But you see, the advantages of a company limited by shares seem to far outweigh the advantages of the other types of companies that can be formed. So when you look at the records, the data, um, possibly from the Office of the Registrar of Companies, I wouldn't I'm hoping I wouldn't be far from right if I should say that more often than not, companies limited by shares are the preferred choice for businessmen and women, even for investors. 
And this is clearly as a result of the numerous advantages that come with that type of company, particularly with respect to the kind of liability that is it. Liability is everything. When it comes to the formation of companies, liability is everything. And you see, that can also be a danger. And that is why many times people have said, how do we guarantee that people don't use the corporate form as a sham, you know, just as a cover up? And then they incur all sorts of liabilities. They just wind down, close down the company and run away because they know that, oh, at the end of the day, generally, the general position is that if I form a company limited by shares, uh, my liability is limited to a certain amount that I owe the company. And because it's a limited liability company, the debts of the company are not my debt. So to answer your question, I think it appears the most preferred type of company is the company limited by shares. But let's also note that particularly with these types of companies that have some foreign participation, there are other laws that relate to companies with foreign participation. So our friends who might be coming into the country as investors from other countries, as foreign investors, they need to also look at the provisions of the GMPC, the GIPC Act, the Ghana Investment Promotion uh, Center Act, to know the additional requirements that come with operating a business or forming a business here in Ghana that has some foreign participation. But I think generally the company limited by shares appears to be the most preferred um, type of company for, for all. Okay, 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 that's a good one. Um, I know our time is fast spent. We are almost into an hour of our discussion. There may be some questions. There are about five questions that uh, we may want to let everyone know. So the first one is from Rudolf. He says that a company limited by guarantee shall not for the purpose of incorporation. Uh, I'm trying to read. Just, just a minute. So I'll read, but if anyone has a question, the person can raise his hand. Chairman Sefa, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And thank you, Gertrude, for your well, uh, recent uh, submissions. So my, to my question, in terms of company limited by liability, whereby um, or limited by shares, whereby liability of directors are to, uh, to um, as it were limited to the shares or whatever investment they have in the company. I, I would like to know in the case of probably um, negligence from one of their employees that affects a customer and the customer seeks to sue, who ordinarily might be held responsible or who, who might be in the suit, I, I should say. So, so just to put an example, for instance, I walk into a hospital negligence of one doctor and um, I, I encounter any issue not, not the, uh, to be expected and I want to sue the hospital. Who, who do I put in my suit or who should be held liable? Thank you. Okay. Yes, um, I think I understand your question. And um, I'd rather want to approach it from the general first, because issues of medical negligence might have um, different rules regarding who ought to be sued. But you see, one of the things I may have failed to say is that with the, corp with, with the company, once you successfully incorporate a company through registration, there are certain things that follow. One of the, the most basic one is what we have already mentioned, the fact that the company becomes a separate legal entity, which is different from those who work there or even the shareholders um, who came together to form the company. The other thing is that because the company is a person in law, it's an entity on its own, the company can sue and the company can also be sued. So if there's some wrongdoing and the wrongdoing, for example, is caused by someone who was acting on behalf and for the company, that wrongdoing becomes the wrongdoing of the company and not he or she, the officer who may have occasioned that wrongdoing. So when it comes to the appropriate person to sue, 
once there's an infraction by a company, the position of the law is that because it is an incorporated company, the company can sue. So the company as an entity can sue you, um, my good friend who just spoke. Maybe you owe the company. The company, um, let's say the company is called um, OB Limited Company. That company can bring an action against you, my good friend, to recover the amount that you owe to it. At the same time, if you enter the premises of the company and let's say uh, the floor was wet and you fall and you suffer a broken hip, a hip, the appropriate person to sue is the company as an entity because the company has the capacity to what? Sue and be sued. Yes, can we? Um, Thank you very much, carefully. So the next question is from Kofi. He asks that my, fi my fiancé as a sole proprietorship company. Once we get married, do I automatically become liable for whatever happens in the <laughs> company? What happens during spousal property distributions in divorce? I think this question should be restricted to the finance aspect of the sole, sole proprietorship. <laughs> okay. Um, I divorce, divorce property things is too, too broad for today's discussion. Right. So please, what, can you please repeat the first part of the question then that I'm supposed to so address? My fiancé has a sole proprietorship company. Once we get married, do I automatically become liable for whatever happens in the company? Okay. So um, I, I think let, let's try and then do a brief correction. Let's rather say your fiancé has a sole proprietorship, simply put, or your, your fiancé has a sole proprietorship business. Because once you talk of a company, that a company is a different form of business organization from a sole proprietorship. So if your fiancé has a sole proprietorship business that she's running, she is a proprietor. She is the owner of that business. The debts of uh, that business are her debts, uh, which she has to take care of. Now, if you get married to her, I, I don't think there's any requirement anywhere that you automatically also become liable for the debts of, of, of that business. Such like that if your fiancé has borrowed an amount of 1,000 CDs from a supplier, and that supplier is coming after her for the money, and she comes to find you at home, the question then becomes, can she insist on taking that money from you? Well, I guess it will be a matter of the arrangement or the agreement between you and your fiancé. But mind you, even the fact of marriage does not um, of itself make you an automatic uh, proprietor as well. It's fine. You can administer the sole proprietorship jointly, uh, in which case you could say that, well, you share the liabilities of that uh, business with her. But in the absence of any such um, agreement, I wouldn't say that you have to share the liabilities of the business with her. Okay, Max is also asking, can a guarantee company be converted to limited liability company by shares? If no, what are the alternatives available? Yes, the answer there is no. Companies can be converted. So for example, a company limited by shares can be converted to a company limited by guarantee. But in the wisdom of the law, you cannot convert a company limited by guarantee into a company limited by shares. And I think there's sound reasoning for that. A company that was primarily formed to carry out, you know, uh, charitable activities. It, it, it may not, in terms of public policy, it may not be very sound to allow such a company to all of a sudden be converted into a company limited by shares, but rather you can convert, you can convert your company limited by shares into one limited by guarantee. Um, okay, is Mr. Moderator there, please? Other than that, I'll look at some of the, I can see some questions in the um, the chat box okay, myself. So, okay, he's back. Very well. Please go on. And then um, Daniel Beidou, I see your hand is up. You can ask a question. Okay, uh, please. Uh, uh, my question is, regarding to a company limited by guarantee, I think that one is, we've all agreed upon that, that one hasn't been registered in order to make a profit. But here is a case, eight profits must be retained for furtherance of the activities or the day-to-day -day activities of the, of the company. But I'm, I'm, I'm here to ask, what, what if maybe the company decides one day to distribute some portion of 
the profit to its members. Is there any legal consequence that a company might face, or the companies, uh, the company is not going to face any legal consequence? Okay, thank you. So, um, Isabelu, like we said in the course of the discussion, the profits of a company limited by guarantee are not to be distributed. They are not to be distributed. Is a is a no, no, no. It is simply not acceptable. It is unlawful, illegal to do so. Yes, and one that is found out, there are sanctions that arise out of that. Uh, you can look at the provisions of the Companies Act, but primarily there are penalties that can be paid or that can be um, imposed on the members of that company because of the fact that they have decided to distribute any profits that have come to the company. All right, I think, um, is there any other hand? Jake, Jake, you can go ahead and ask your, your question. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. Uh, you. Madam, uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the insights uh, you have given us all. Uh, your, your explanation and your, your education was mostly geared towards uh, upon incorporation of a company. The, I mean, the liability of the, uh, 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 that accrued to the company is limited to only the shareholders who are uh, yet to pay or the, the amount which is unpaid on the assets and all that. My question, I mean, as a layman and to the benefit of other laymen also uh, on the page, my question is, what about liability which accrues to uh, uh, officers of the company which is yet to be incorporated? So if a company is yet to be incorporated, any liability which accrues to these officers or these uh, uh, either direct, whatever, whoever plays a role before a company is incorporated, if uh, liability accrues to them, what will be the position of the law? Thank you. Um, okay, Jake, now um, you, cannot, you cannot deceive me uh, by passing off as a layman. You are one of my students, you are a law student, and um, as a matter of fact, this is a question that I even reserve the right to refuse to answer and rather ask you um, to answer because typical of law students, before they ask a question, they even know the answer. They just want to run it by the speaker to see whether what they are thinking is right or not. So uh, you have to desist from deceiving us that you are a lay person. Anyway, so uh, with that being said, maybe, you see, prior to the formation of a company, there are certain activities that happen because you don't just get up and then boom, a company is formed. We have what we call some pre-incorporation activities. So before a company is formed, is incorporated, the people who take steps towards its formation in law, we call them the promoters of that company. Um, and they are taking steps towards ensuring that the company is formed. Even as promoters, they have certain responsibilities in law. The law expects them to act in a certain way. So as a promoter, as someone who is working towards the formation of a company, you are not supposed to, for example, um, use um, the, the monies being used towards the formation of the company for your own personal benefit. If some information comes to you in the course of the, 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 your work as a promoter, you're not supposed to use that information for your personal benefit. So for example, you are working towards the formation of a company that uses a secret ingredient. Uh, in a product that it produces. Because you're a promoter, you get to know of that secret ingredient and then immediately uh, you run to go and set up a rival company using that same secret ingredient. So I'd want to look at your question in the context of pre-incorporation activities and promoters and say that, yes, if you are someone who is working towards the formation of a company, the law imposes certain obligations on you. And if you breach or if you, if you break those duties that are placed on you as a promoter, there are liabilities that follow. Because once the company is formed, the company can come after you. So if you have made certain profits as a promoter, the company can come after you for a retrieval of those profits. If you have used certain confidential information for your um, personal purposes, the company can come after you for compensation for that. So that, that really would be my response to your question. Thank you, Madam.
And Jacob Okain, our CEO, has his raised. We'll take one or two more questions and we'll, we'll go to Kate down on today's discussion. Jacob, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Um, good evening. Yes, uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Okay, and thank you very much, Madam. Um, I am. Um, my question is on um, this issue of um, uh, lifting of the corporate veil, so that you go after directors who have um, engaged in any fraud that has led to the liquidation or the winding up of the company. Um, I think the law has made it so open to the, in my in my opinion, so open to the extent that uh, there's there is no limited time to make sure that these issues are looked into so that these um, uh, perpetrators are brought to book, so that um, those who have suffered uh, in terms of, of money invested in the company, so that they will be made better off in the position they were before the company going into, into liquidation. So um, I'm asking if there, is, there, there could be a situation where there, where there would be a time limit so that um, those who, are, who, who get into that uh, uh, fraud activity uh, uh, as soon as possible brought to a um, uh, book because there could be situations where people will be chasing their monies here and there, going for lawyers, incurring some costs. And end of the day, some will even get costs that are even beyond the money that they've, they've invested. Some even die in the course of it. So um, I'm asking this uh, humble question that there, is, would there be such a situation or is there anything like that? Well, um, thank you for your question. Well, you see, one thing we need to understand is that um, as someone who wants to indulge in some form of litigation, there's a requirement for you to act timelessly and for you to act diligently. Now, um, in law, we have what we call the, the statute of limitations. So depending on the type of case that you have, the courts are open to you or you are allowed to bring an action in court within a particular period. So for example, uh, if someone owes you an amount of money and you want to recover that debt, you might have within um, six years to bring that debt. Other than that, we say that your action becomes statute bad and you cannot go to court. Now, when it comes to the kind of issues that you are describing, of course, as, as someone who is affected by the activities of a particular company right. and who is seeking to proceed to court for the court to possibly lift the corporate veil. Um, the caution always is that immediately you detect that you need to act timelessly. But the other thing we need to understand is that our judicial system has its own processes, which a litigant is required to follow. So in as much as, in as, much as litigants would be happy if their cases would be dealt with expeditiously. Sometimes we also need to understand that litigation requires that particular steps are followed. And sometimes in the course of that time, you know, elapses. But that also does not mean that the court should not do their best to try and deal with some of these situations um, in an expedited manner, especially because of the reason you have given. For people, for some people, all their funds may be locked up in such cases. For others, they might be suffering from conditions uh, that will not allow them to uh, actively pursue the process, or some may even die in the process. So the point is that let us understand that litigation in itself, the judicial system has certain processes that must be followed, which we cannot rush. But at the same time, we also know that the courts also try to do their best to be able to handle these matters um, ex expeditiously. Thank you very much. All right, so Madam Gertrude. We are extremely grateful for your time, your knowledge, your insights, and all that you shared with us today. Uh, I know the time you gave us an hour, but you've extended it to an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we are sorry for delaying you for 15 more minutes. And I'm sure there were a lot of discussions which we didn't even delve into. The registration yeah. processes, the timeline for registration, and then others. And then, uh, very soon, we'll come back to your doorstep to plead that you gift us your time again. So we are grateful for your time, and we thank you for making the time to join us. Now, the lawyer's diary is also back. We went off for some time, and we had several calls to come back, and we are back. And today's program, I think, has been one of the highly attended programs. We had over 95 participants 
online and then um, even on Facebook and then the other networks too, there are a lot of people who are joining us live. So we are grateful, Madam, and thank you for your time as well. Yes, um, thank you so much, um, Lawyer, for having me. I think you guys are doing a great job and you must all be encouraged. I'm also grateful to all our friends um, who have joined us, particularly my students. I can see a large number of them in the audience. For those who have taken company law already, those who are yet to take company law, I'm, I'm hoping that you have learned one or two things um, which would be to your benefit. So I'm happy I came, thank you. And then we've also displayed our social media handles. On Twitter, we are at Diaries Global, Instagram Lawyers Diary Global, Facebook Lawyers Diary, and then YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of legal topics which we've already done. And then today's discussion will also be uploaded there as well. So thank you. And then next two weeks, we'll be having something on criminalizing the cases of suicide. That is also going to be a very good discussion that I would plead that everyone also makes their time to join. So thank you. I hope to see you next two weeks Friday. Thank you. Thank you.